a discussion afterwards. And judging by how much we were chatting beforehand, I don't think that's going to be hard to get lots of people involved. So maybe just kick off for those who aren't familiar with your work, um, just um, a short pricey of some of your critical projects, and then we'll, we'll have a discussion afterwards. Great. Well, thank you, Francis, and I'm honored to be here. Uh, and it looks like all the leading lights of English architecture are on board. So there's nothing I can uh, tell you, but I'd love to share you with you my mediocre attempts and love to hear your uh, comments or advice. Um, I still don't know how to design a metric, but at any rate, it's great to be here. Let's uh, look at a few things. This is uh, our latest project, uh, a college chapel. And it uh, has a lot of inspiration from certain buildings in England, London. I don't know, you have some architects named, named after birds and after, um, what's the other one? It's, he's named one of the same, uh, the Bee Gees. There's two guys in London, very good. Um, and this uh, building had a lot of inspiration of that. And of course, um, the interior also, uh, which we uh, still, I'm sorry, borrowed a lot of great ideas from our English overlords in the early days and we still learn a lot from you. So this was a, a, a recent project. One of the things I was very proud of that if you're a Terry, you're not impressed by, but all of these stone columns are load bearing, which is according to most of my structural engineers illegal, but uh, we found a, uh, uh, engineer from MIT, John Oxendorf, who said I could do it. And then I found Mark Kennedy, an architect in um, Ohio, that said he was willing to figure it out. So all these stone columns are load bearing, again, fairly anathema to American architects today. But of course, we've done this for at least 100 years. Oh, sorry, a couple thousand, I don't know, long time. So it was great fun. Indiana limestone. Uh, that rose onyx is from Persia. Marble is, we always have our marble carved in Italy. Um, and uh, this is our sixth organ case with a great organ builder, Paul Fritz from, uh, from Tacoma, Washington. And uh, it's that nice tradition of having a front organ, the organ de Kerr, and then the back organ eventually in the choir loft. It will be the powerful one. And they want to do even song here. Those of you who are uh, you, probably knowledgeable about those things because the president, Dr. Arne, did his postdoc studying uh, one of your most famous prime ministers. Um, and I don't think it was John Major, um, somebody in the World War II. And he did his postdoc um, uh, working with Martin on uh, the biography of Winston Churchill and loves even song in the Oxford colleges. So there's a lot of uh, Anglomania here, which is all good. The balconies are something I never do uh, for Catholic churches, but this was very important to them visually to have that uh, as well as it allowed us to make a 600 seat church uh, into a 1400 seat church. Basically double the size. This is a much more affordable building for a high school in Tampa, a boys, all boys high school run by the Jesuits. And their plan was to renovate a hexadecagon, whatever that is from 1960. And I said, fine, we could do that. Very low ceiling, fairly ugly, falling apart. And I said, could you let me do a second design for free and we'll see what it costs. So we came up with this very simple building to try to compete with the, the design to renovate a 1960s building. And fortunately it was close in budget and they went for it and uh, Chapel of the Holy Cross, very cubic. Simple limestone detailing, uh, two statues out front. I don't know who they are. <clears throat> There's uh, the president, Father Hermes, classical man, aptly named. <clears throat> and then it's a, it's a cubic exterior, but the interior is a little bit of a fun surprise. I've always wanted to do an octagonal church 
Uh, and this was the right client because like I said, their old church was a hexadecagon. I thought that was eight sides too many. And so we did an octagon, a much better sounding uh, room, but I'd made it an irregular octagon. And you can see then it, uh, you put an octagon in a square and you get these little residual spaces, perfect to put uh, martyred uh, Jesuits uh, and then a little sanctuary and <laughs> sacristy. Uh, these were all painted by wonderful Spanish painter, Raul Berzosa. The marble, uh, we emphasized here the marble uh, on the altar, very simple altar, but fantastical marble, I think. And then uh, showing off the slightly Baroque um, retablo with this amazing painting when Christ appears to St. Ignatius. This is a recent um, uh, renovation of a church. This is how it looked. Uh, it was built as a church in 1960, uh, became a cathedral in 1984, was never really converted to a cathedral, was kind of un, kind of, uh, you know, wrecked a little bit. And so we were asked to come in and make it a cathedral and uh, on a very low budget. Just try to bring out some of the elements that were there. Uh, the original architect of the building was the firm of Ralph Adams Cram. He was already passed away, but it's a beautiful church, but never a cathedral. So we felt that it needed something like a Baldacchino and something like a cathedra. I'm not sure if that's where the word cathedral comes from or not, and where the bishop sits, and then a, a prominent ambo or pulpit there with the sounding board. So that's the main thing. There's some other things we did. This nice, uh, beautiful diaper pattern on uh, canvas was painted by Evergreen. And we have some wonderful statues of Peter and Paul going in as well as some other things. Trying to relate to the beautiful, simple uh, Gothic interior and add something to it. The original building, the details or the specialty items are all kind of art deco. I call them kind of art deco Gothic. And so we, um, that was kind of interesting, but we have gone to something maybe a little bit more, uh, I don't know, more ancient than that, as much as I like the art deco. This next one is a college chapel at a school where they emphasize the great books. And Thomas Aquinas College, a lot of the professors studied philosophy at Notre Dame. And they wanted a chapel to seat, let's say 700, that would accommodate the whole student body, but it should embody all of the Western tradition. And when I was asked to do that, I said, that's no problem. Um, that's kind of a joke, but at any rate, we tried to bring out some of the California missions uh, by going directly back to the Spanish uh, Renaissance on the facade. Um, but there is a simplicity about the sides and the back. Uh, this great tower uh, is related to the name of the church, Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity. And uh, they have their two favorite teachers out front. Both are people with the letter A. Um, they were all A students, uh, Aquinas and Augustine, and a nice coat of arms and Mary on the apex. The interior, the uh, president, President Dillon, who's a philosopher, it's not a big building, but he wanted to feel um, grand or he wanted to feel beautiful. And he was aware that that needed length. Uh, undoubtedly, he was thinking about weddings and things like that. You need length for the aisle. So we took a fairly small church and increased its length by narrowing it and allowing the proportion to be, you know, one to one and a half in height. But it's a very narrow church. For those of you from Notre Dame who are watching, the width is a little bit narrower than the Basilica uh, at Notre Dame. And uh, it's 27 feet. And the side aisles are consciously really huge because for certain events during the year, we bring in chairs and that's kind of neat. 24 Botticino columns, uh, 
uh, one piece, and then 80 pilasters, marble pilasters. And when they hired me to do this, I said yes, but I'd like to do over 20. I'd like to do at least 20 columns and at least 75 pilasters, and they agreed to that. So that was the goal of the project. Just kidding. But anyway, a bronze bowl Aquino uh, made in Spain, and uh, the first uh, Solomonic uh, columns in uh, three years. I think Francis did the ones right before this. And uh, some nice side altars in uh, marble as well. So really fun project, great people working on it. Evergreen from New York helped me on it. A lot of plaster work, uh, barrel vaults. Um, this is what I think what Brunelleschi would have done if he could have, if, his, if the Medici's could have afforded it. That's kind of the goal, you know? They were kind of cheapskates, as you know, flat ceilings and stuff. They really, you know, should have gone a little further. Um, this was built right around the same time as the last one. The last one was, I think of as a chapel for uh, philosophers. This is a church for uh, theologians or for common people. And so it's more, uh, the exterior is rough and ready, stone, set in a hill, pilgrimage church. Uh, I'm thinking, you know, Tuscany, uh, Italy. Uh, you walk up the hill to get there. Um, and it has a dome and a tower you can see for, you know, for half a mile. It's fairly rough and ready on the outside, fairly rugged. Uh, uh, most of these early projects, we worked with a local architect, which was great fun and very good engineers. Um, yeah, and this is Our Lady of Guadalupe, which is kind of the, uh, the US version of the great shrine in Mexico City and uh, where Mary appeared to a uh, uh, Mexican Indian, and uh, she revealed herself to him. And so we are, are taking that story and developing it up in Wisconsin. But the interior is meant to be that theologians kind of interior with very rich and warm and colorful and stained glass and bas reliefs and ornament and gold leaf. And of course, the ubiquitous Baldacchino, which I love for freestanding altars. organ case. Beautiful side altars. I'm always trying to do custom art uh, to get the client to agree to hire people and then to work with a with not the usual typical Roman Catholic solution of uh, crucifix, Mary and Joseph. I'm trying to do something. And so we, uh, the Cardinal Burke, who was the client here, uh, chose some side altars. If you look at the one on the left, you see the Divine Mercy, uh, St. Maria Gretti, wonderful young woman who was martyred in the 20th century, and then St. Peregrine, who is the uh, patron saint of falcons, sorry, of uh, cancer sufferers. And so we had wonderful uh, artists here, uh, Nielsen Carlin and Noah Buchanan, and uh, Tony Visco and others do original uh, sacred art for us. And for me, that's one of the things that is the most moving and uh, I hear from the visitors, most of the people ignore the architecture and just look at the art, which is good. It's really a, a place for people to go and feel embraced and feel like it's their place. I love this double dome um, view. I've always wanted to do a building with multiple domes. So I snuck it in under the Baldacchino there. And then the St. Joseph Cathedral is by one of our great 20th century um, church architects. His name was Emmanuel Masquerade. Um, I guess he's not really one of ours, but he moved here after he got a really good education at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. He went to work with his buddies from school, uh, Whitney Warren and Warren and Wetmore, who did things like, uh, you've never heard of, but things like Grand Central Station in New York. And then he went out and did the St. Louis World's Fair and he ended up doing a bunch of churches and cathedrals in the upper Midwest where it's nice and cold, where it's not too, it never gets too warm. This is South Dakota and he had done the cathedral and the co-cathedral in St. Paul, Minnesota. And then this is a minor little tiny cathedral in the middle of nowhere and it's just a little gem. But on the left, this is the way we found it. Nice uh, kind of Art Deco, Baldacchino done in the forties. 
and everything else is kind of whitewashed and the light lighting is bad and the floor is nothing and they have nice banners and the, actually you, you may not be able to tell that but that red thing to the right of the center that's the altar they put it off center and then the ambos kind of to the left and then there's this funny little chair right in the center all made out of to look like concrete and so it had been kind of uh, messed up and so we were asked to bring it back to the way it would have been if it had ever been finished if it had, it never was if it had been finished by masquerade and gorman this is what we think it might have looked like and this building does not have a dome but it's a cathedral and so again, my penchant for domes uh, and this vaulted ceiling, I said, it really does need, why don't we do a circular baldacchino? That's a crazy idea. Are you gonna do a circular altar? No, but uh, I did find as I researched Masqueray, his early designs for the cathedral in St. Paul, which you're gonna see in a minute, maybe, he, he proposed a very beautiful circular baldacchino inspired by Val de Grasse in Paris. And so we tried to take a kind of simpler version of that, that he might have done um, if he had been able to. And uh, you can see the see other things. The circular uh, ambo with the canopy, the high altar, the multiple different kinds of marble that are kind of layering up. Now you can make out some of the images on the ceiling. The great chandeliers were ripped out in the 50s because they were probably using too much electricity. And so we reconstructed them from really bad grainy photographs. Uh, and we put in, you know, 100 extra lights to shine up on the ceiling to illuminate the interior because modern people like to see things. And then the faux marble columns were all proposed in 1920, but never executed. So this is uh, a work uh, as, as we said with um, Bishop Swain, this is a work of creative restoration. Almost everything that we did was not there, was never there, except for the colors. Uh, well, even those probably it's, it's in our mind, but it's creatively uh, bringing this cathedral up to its status. Um, again, if, the, if Masqueray and the Bishop Gorman had been alive to uh, pay for it. This is what they would have done, maybe. Wonderful American sculptor, Cody Swanson, who um, can't get a job in America, so he lives in uh, Par in um, Florence. Uh, I don't know why you would live in Florence, but uh, he did this sculpture here. And there's one of the uh, Boldacchino columns. I think they're composite. I think that's what you call them, Francis. And you've done lots of these, but um, this was my first uh, five, four and a half foot composite column out of Cora marble. And then to just make it even worse, we gold leafed it. So that's a few thoughts on cathedrals and churches. And Great, that, that was fascinating. And wonderful to see that you do the all of the uh, furniture and everything else. Um, I've got a lot of questions to ask. I, I might just sort of um, far away. Am I am I visible or not? Well, it doesn't matter. If yeah. I'm yeah, you look great. Uh, thank you. Uh, you're too kind. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, just I. I how did you start? Were you always into classical architecture? Did you start as a modernist? That's something I don't know about you. Did you come? Do you? You didn't have a kind of classical architect dad or something like that? Or um... no, 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 no. I think I only know one person like that. But um, no, I had a modernist architect dad who studied with Lucan, and we traveled around seeing modernist buildings, but also classical buildings and Gothic buildings, and uh, lived in London for a couple of years when I was a kid. And so I grew up with a great love of history, fell in love with Thomas Jefferson, thought he wasn't a bad uh, president, but even a better architect. And so that got me on the uh, uh, direction of classical architecture. And I started comparing everything that I saw with things like Jefferson. And then Jefferson showed me his teacher, I forget his name, starts with an 
on it's like starts with an A and ends with a P. Anyway, I studied with him and then um, did have the fortune to go to work for a guy that you might know, Alan Greenberg. Oh, yeah. And on my honeymoon, I went to see the architect dad that you know. And nice. I had a great time in, um, in Dedham Vale uh, meeting Quinlan Terry, one of the great experiences of my life going from Alan Greenberg to Quinlan Terry. And that was a great, great uh, meeting for me. He probably wasted his day. But um, my wife wanted to go there to see um, a place where like famous British painters painted uh, trees with like lots of white dots in it. And then also like horses and stuff. She wanted to go there. And I wanted to go to see the famous uh, British living architect, Quinlan Terry. And he was very kind and brought me into his palatial office. And, uh, and he was doing, he was doing, somebody was drawing a uh, balustrade and it was like at full scale. It was like, you know, a meter tall. I think that's what you guys call it, uh, three feet tall. And I was like, what the heck? Why are you drawing it at full scale? And he says, well, how else do you know how it, how it looks? And so that inspired me and I brought it back to Alan Greenberg's and we started drawing everything at full scale. And of course then, you know, God created uh, the, the computer and now everything's perfect. But at any rate, that was a great experience for me. Yeah, how interesting. And did you, but when, when I mean, obviously a, a father who is very keen on Louis Kahn, that's quite a, quite a shift. I mean, do you see something in, I mean, it's interesting that you're interested in load bearing because obviously that's something that Khan like very kind of massive, heavy buildings. Do, do you see something in that? Or was it a kind of complete rejection of that? Oh, that's a great question. Well, yeah, so I did grow up with Lou Khan and Jergala and all those guys. And of course, Corbubu and Frank Lloyd Wright, all of those were heroes. And I went to the University of Virginia and that was fine. And then I went to uh, Yale and there we actually had the pleasure of three buildings by Lou Kahn on the same street and they're all magnificent they're all great masterpieces but the buildings built before them by people you've never heard of were much better so that's what kind of opened my eyes that these uh, the Yale Art Gallery by Kahn is famous building 1953 but it's basically brick wall with horizontal stone stripes kind of neat but the building next to it um, the Yale Art Gallery in 1919 um, uh, by um, what's his name the guy who did the um, Chicago uh, Elks Memorial, um, much better building, Romanesque, phenomenal. So I started comparing, basically for me, it was to compare. I said, well, that's pretty good, Duncan, but is it good enough? Well, what's your standard? So I started picking my standards and it was, first it was Jefferson and then it was other things. And then it was Palladio and uh, there's lots of other great architects, but I think you we need to have standards. And that's what kind of convinced me that uh, there was a tradition with a big T. If you wanted to, you could be part of it. You have to embrace it. You can't fiddle around. And uh, I started trying to do that at Yale. I met some uh, people, uh, Thomas Gordon Smith, uh, Rob Creer, the Venturis. Um, there's a bunch of guys there actually then. And there was this uh, historian, Vincent Scully, who was on the classical kick. So there's this whole interest in classical architecture at the time and urbanism. And, uh, but for me, it was just, it was just kind of comparing old buildings and new buildings and seeing which held up and which were more beautiful and which ennobled people. What, what ennobles people more? And, and you like that and I like this, but which is better for people? And so that's what I, okay. I, I've been trying to do. Uh, uh, yes, I, I was gonna uh, actually neatly comes onto another question I've got, which is your, your work is very classical of the kind of loosely um, Palladio, Jefferson tradition. Um, and there isn't a, you don't do much Gothic. And I, I was just interested in, because there are lots of Gothic churches and you say that there was this very good uh, Romanesque building that you saw. Um, and then I've also, I mean, I'd be interested to know as well, um, you have Baroque touches. I remember you were talking about that altarpiece where you said we've gone slightly Baroque, um, but, you know, would you ever do a kind of serpentine front like um, Borromini? Would that interest you? Wow, I would love to. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking for those clients, actually. I think your dad did one of those. And mm. uh, David Watkins says, first time in England to have the double S. Mm. And I didn't even know there was a double S, but certainly I assumed all the British architects from Nash on had done double S's. No, that's a joke. But your dad did a double S on that nice house. Yeah, and yeah, yes, yeah. Uh, I think uh, as... Um, my teacher, Jim Jarek said, you know, go for Baroque. 
uh, if we can do it, uh, you have to have the right client and the right uh, budget and uh, really pushing it. I would love to do that. So we've been experimenting with that. I guess we've done a couple of altarpieces that have been slightly Baroque and uh, we're about to do something kind of amazing coming up that might be that way. But for me, it's all classical or it's all traditional. So I don't have, uh, I don't have a compunction about it one way or the other, but I do think that you have to be good at what you do. So I don't think you should just, uh, like my friends who do houses, they change styles every week and that's great, but I, I can't do that. I, it takes me too long to learn how to do, mm. how to mess uh, buildings before I do Quinlan Terry buildings. You know, it takes me a while, so I'm slow. So um, I, I, I suppose the other thing is, um, uh, I think that there's often, a, I mean, a, well, my father and I worked on it too, on um, Brentwood Cathedral. There are kind of two uh, ways of looking at church architecture. There are those who feel that churches are celebrations of the greatest of man's creativity, and um, they should be as, uh, as opulent, as expressive as possible because it's God's house. And there are others who kind of want to make it completely pared down. And then, of course, there's the kind of people who say, you know, things move on, we should, I'd be interested to know how you answer those, uh, you know, because there are some crazy cathedrals out, um, Catholic churches around, really bizarre buildings, hideous, actually, in my opinion. Um, do you ever come across them, those sort of clients? What, what do you say to them when they say, can we have one that looks like, a, um, you know, a crystal with um, a spaceship? for a roof or something what 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 how do you how do you turn that into one of yours yeah no i mean 30 years ago i did talk to people like that they didn't know any better and they called me on the phone and uh, i lost those jobs real quickly um i think most of those clients in the catholic church are dead at least in the u.s um mm. the new generation of bishops and priests and i say new generation probably most bishops you know 70 and under prefer traditional architecture or at least they wouldn't admit to liking those modernist buildings in right. public. Mm. Uh, with it, maybe with a few exceptions, important exceptions on the West Coast or whatever. Uh, but yeah, we've done a bad job in the last 60 years with uh, architecture and certainly Catholic church architecture has been hideous. Uh, I can't really think of any that are any good. And it has a little bit to do with the, uh, the arrogance of the architect and maybe the client and we don't really need that. You know, we really need uh, humility is actually a virtue in Christianity. And it's better to be, if, if you can't do something really well, then you should be humble and do it, you know, competently rather mm. than try and, uh, you know, reinvent the wheel and confuse people. And those cathedrals should be torn down, unfortunately, waste of money and probably turn people away from the faith. Yes, I mean, th I guess that's the thing. I mean, we, we come across this thing where people say, um, I, I've seen this in actually the Protestant church, people saying, oh, we have to look like we're of the future. Mm. And it, it's a difficult, I mean, I, I think it's quite easy to answer, but um, those people, re they really exist in England. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, maybe it's more of a Protestant than a Catholic. I think I it is a Protestant thing. I think that the Catholics have rediscovered their tradition, which is 2000 years of architecture. And again, as a, as a Westerner, we can say it goes back to the Greeks. Mm. And we can learn from all of that. And we have a great uh, richness that we should build upon. And, um, but if you, uh, but I do see in America, at any rate, I see inklings of interest amongst uh, Protestants because, um, you know, what, what we have been building for Protestant churches in the last 50 years has just gone from bad to worse. And now we're building, um, you know, shop, uh, the equivalent of shopping malls or or, uh, you know, uh, Walmart, uh, you know, we call them big box stores, you know, for, uh, mm. for uh, worship spaces. And, and again, they're only meant to last 20 years, which is fine because the church is gonna be closed in 20 years. So people have an inkling of that. And there is a small kind of remnant of Protestants who are hankering for beauty and tradition. And we'll see, uh, but I'm not holding my breath, but we'll see how that goes. Okay, I, there's there's more questions, but since I've got the um, controls, I'll I'll keep going for a bit longer. But if you if you've got a question, I'll come to you. I um, I'm just quite interested in, in the the sort of style debate. Yes. Um, do you think that there is a, a 
a relationship between, if you think of the um, things like Alberti saw a relationship between the, the perfect numbers of the universe and the perfect numbers of architecture and also the perfect numbers of music. You know, if you get a, a violin string of the same tension and you have one half the length, same half the length for the other, that's an octave and it sounds beautiful. Um, do, you, it, do you subscribe to that? Do you think your, your buildings through their numbers are expressive, uh, is, is, is have a, um, I suppose, a, a relationship to God in some way? Yeah, the thing that I like to talk about is less the harmonic ratios, which are of great interest. Uh, and many good architects have tried to uh, employ them. I like to talk about um, transcendence and that churches need verticality. And that means the proportion needs to be more than one to one. And the great churches are closer to one to two or two to three. And then the, then the great cathedrals, uh, the Gothic cathedrals tend to be one to three. Uh, it tends to be a Gothic um, thing. And I like to talk about transcendence and I like to look at um, directionality, that there needs to be a beginning and an end and that directionality is a, is a little microcosm of our lives. Um, it's expressing our journey. And so we need directionality. And so that's where the columns and the arcades and the colonnades and the pilasters and the vaulted ceilings and the coffers and all those things can, can reinforce that. But you need an ending, you need a focus. And that focus is, you could say, temporal because it's during our short lives, but it's meant to give us a hankering or a desire for that eternal focus, which is a paradise, which is heaven. And so can we get a glimpse of heaven in the church? I think that's the true test of a building, whether it's simple or complex, whether it's Gothic or Baroque, does it give us a sense of the heavenly uh, realm and the heavenly host that we desire to be part of and that, that we are part of in a certain way? Yeah. Um, okay. That, that, I, I've got more to say on that, um, I, but maybe I'll come back to it when we sum up. I'll give someone else a chance. Um, Mark, um, you've got a question. Do you want to unmute and say it rather than me repeat it rather badly? Well, Francis, is that, can you hear? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm sure you wouldn't have, you'd, you would have enhanced it. But uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you very much to Duncan and also for all, all those little bits of humor that, that uh, you don't, you know, on Zoom, you can't hear everyone else chuckling, but I hope there were people chuckling out there. I did like Go for Baroque. Um, uh, and there were various others there that you associate with sort of English, um, you know, sort of downplayed understated humor. I, I didn't know it survived in the States in any form. So and that was good. Sorry. So the question. Um, yes, with your first church, the one with the load bearing columns, um, was what was the, the nature of the vault? I mean, was it lightweight and suspended? Or was that really a heavy uh, bit of construction on those columns? Well, you got me on that one. It's lightweight. But I do want to say that one of the reasons it led me to that project was John Oxendorf wrote a book on the Guastavino tile, which you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, they're great Spanish uh, builders in uh, the US who brought that Spanish tradition of the overlapping tiles. And he gave this great lecture. I said, I loved it. And he says, well, Duncan, you should build this way. And I said, I could never build that way because they have all these interior train stations and, and um, museums. I said, there's no way my buildings need to have beautiful plaster vaults and, you know, silly to pay all that money for a tile vault and then plaster it and then, you know, put decoration on it. And so he says, well, OK, so then three years later, I got this commission and I said, well, this is my chance. I can do a structural vault yep. and uh, in fact, a dome, a load bearing structural dome. And I wanted to do it in tile, uh, Guastavino tile with uh, John Oxendorf's help. And he says, oh, why don't we do it in limestone? Because he hadn't done it in limestone. I said, well, that's a cool idea. And well, it came in pretty high in cost. And um, uh, we said, well, we could do it in brick. So anyway, right, so this is uh, the first uh, brick dome in the US of its size in a long time. And uh, it's all structural, it's all load bearing and it sits on load bearing you know, curved stone beams and the stone beams sit on load bearing stone columns. Um, 
So unfortunately, the vaults are not true, but uh, some of the other things are the columns and, and this whole contraption of dome uh, thing, which is uh, fun. And I can't wait for the next client to let me do something even bigger and better. Maybe a, maybe a brick vault or a marble vault. We actually are thinking about a marble vault right now, but it's a small one, oval maybe, oval. Do, do, do. Excellent. No, no, good to hear. And uh, do you, yes, John, John Oxendorf's a great guy. And um, yeah, he's also been trying to get me to do a vault in a project, but uh, it didn't, it didn't, uh, there were other reasons why that, that couldn't happen. But anyway, um, you, would, Thanks, you would be a natural to do Roman vaulting or some kind of vaulting in your projects. Well, I was hoping, I was hoping, but you know, uh, other factors won out and it's 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 concrete damn it but yeah 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 um well, but doing in the u.s is concrete vaults there's been a number of vaults in the u.s that are masonry uh i'm thinking of the yale colleges and they do they you've de probably done this but you know they do a concrete vault upside down and place the brick in it and then hoist it up upside down and we've been doing that in the u.s and uh i thought it was better to do the harder more difficult, more expensive way to do it. Yeah, good for you. Well, thank you. Thank you. I have a question, Francis. That's okay. Go on. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Duncan. That was really great to see all your work. Um, I kind of have a more, I guess, logistical question. Um, I don't see um, many of us here in the UK designing many, you know, beautiful churches because we just have so many already <laughs> um and I'm also just thinking through planning states which is I guess for you you would call it entitlements um comments from the local authority like oh that tower those domes would be have an impact on the landscape or it, it would have some sort of visual impact on the city and it may cause concern um or raise objections. I'm wondering, have you ever experienced any of that with, with any of the work uh, you've done um, with any of those churches that you've just shown us? Little bit, little bit. Um, it's interesting, most cities in the US have um, code exceptions for towers and domes and kind of roof me members that are not occupiable. So if I built one of these buildings and it was a condominium or an apartment building, they might complain if people were living up in the tower, but uh, since they're, you know, they're kind of appurtenances and non-occupiable uh, spaces, they seem to go over. But the nice thing is that uh, when they get built, uh, the people uh, from the regions uh, that see these buildings tend to, tend to appreciate them. Even if they're of uh, other religion, they tend to appreciate the, you know, the beauty, the addition of the beauty to their towns and villages and Again, that's why there is, we, we thank God for the preservation movement in England and the US, these buildings are valuable, um, even if, you know, maybe um, their uses changed or what have you, but we appreciate that. That's great. I was just wondering if it has been well received <laughs> because they are usually quite visual, visible and very much landmark buildings of the, the place. It's really interesting that a number of our clients have have made me make the towers taller and taller and taller because I think people are now aware that the bell tower is great for bells and we used to put clocks on them in the 1990s but people know how to tell time other other ways now but uh, but I think people are really aware that in a city or a town that a tall vertical obelisk like element can really be a wonderful marker and bring attention to that building to that place add to the skyline and uh, for a while, everybody was trying to use them for uh, cell phone towers. They're trying to use church towers for cell phone towers, which is fine. But um, uh, we've been pretty successful when somebody does complain about towers and domes. We've been pretty successful in convincing the powers that be that actually it's an addition to their city and should be allowed. And once it's built, no complaints. Great, thank you so much. Sorry, I'm just have to scan and see if there's someone, if someone's got another question, otherwise I will keep asking things, um, which I'm happy to do. Okay, right. I can't see anyone, but yeah, the other thing, this is a bit of a technical one. Um, which pattern books do you use? Um, I saw a bit of Palladio, a bit of Vignola, 
Um, do you, is there any Serlio there I'm missing? What are your kind of um, go-to um, uh, Renaissance theses? Yes. On a practical um, level. I, you know, I have to say that my favorite book is the unillustrated Alberti. Really? No, no, no. Um, I was going to say it's the most useless book there is. In Latin, the unillustrated version in Latin. No, but uh, Palladio is the pattern book that I use. And, uh, you know, that's, there's a famous saying by our third president when he wrote to one of his friends, Colonel Cock, he said in architecture, Palladio is the Bible. And so I've tried to do that. It's a very practical book. It's very helpful for an architect and laying out on your desk while you're drawing up ionic volutes, which is what I'm drawing right now. And, uh, uh, but I love it that he shows you his canon the same way that Vignola and others do. But he also shows you all these examples of his buildings, maybe not in detail, but then of these ancient temples in book four. So I love it that you can compare what Palladio did to, uh, you know, ancient temples, Temple of Saturn or, you know, whatever, Tempietto even, and, um, you know, come up with a solution that might work in your project. Uh, so, but I would like to think that in, uh, once you get, once you join the club, the classical club that you uh, are allowed to go to all of those treatises. And so I feel like Palladio has, has opened my eyes to Alberti and Serlio and Vignola, of course, and all the architects that Palladio looked at, uh, both the ancient architects, um, like the Colosseum or Theodore Pacellus or what have you, and the baths, but also uh, the contemporary architects that he learned from like the Sangali and the uh, Bramanti and all of those mm. uh, Peruzzi guys that are so important to him. Although I would like to think he was better than them because he, you know, like any smart student, he learned from them and was able to develop it. Um, not because he was more innovative, but he was able to just do a better job uh, based on their brilliant innovations. And, um, but uh, we, I guess the, the other point I'd like to say is that we do look at uh, Palladio a lot and uh, we look at his buildings a lot. And, I'm a big fan of the P, the P, to me, one of the big debates in architecture is the P's. And that's why I would say uh, Palladio versus Alberti, the, you're either a precedent guy or a principal guy. And Alberti is kind of a principal guy, I think. And people who quote him are principal people, principled. And then there's the precedent guys who look at actual buildings. And Palladio is definitely a building guy. He looks at actual buildings and learns from them. And that's what we do. We look at buildings, actual buildings, not, not the ideal, what they say it's gonna be like, but what it really was and what it is and how can we do something like that today? Uh, so precedent over principle. Okay, that's interesting. Oops, I need to unmute. Francis, you're muted. <laughs> you just muted yourself. Um, I was amused that uh, you said that um, you read or you you would actually use Alberti. I mean, you could never use Alberti in an office. Um, and actually I noticed that he he specifies um, three grooves for a triglyph rather than two. I've never seen three grooves done on a triglyph. Um, uh, I think a lot of, I think the fact that they wrote their treatises rather than illustrated them um, means that they didn't really know what they were going to look like, you know, hence the very ugly um, base uh, for an ionic order that Vitruvius does. Actually, interesting, Vitruvius, is he something, someone you go to at all? Yeah, I guess that was, that's the obvious answer that, um, you know, you, I fell in love with Jefferson, he showed me Palladio, and then uh, Palladio, of course, showed me all the mistakes that Jefferson did that I try not to repeat. Mm. Um, especially copying that round building in Rome that Mark Wilson Jones likes so much, I would never do that. But um, no, but uh, Palladio then shows you Albert, uh, shows you not Albert, he shows you Vitruvius and he says, I took Vitruvius for my master and guide. Um, and I, I've always likened that to Dante and Virgil, you know, oh Virgil, my guide, who's gonna take me through Hades and through purgatory. And um, so, um, yeah, so uh, Vitruvius is definitely the guide for Palladio. And so, so I, I, I have great, Great admiration for Vitruvius and in spite of X, Y, and Z that he did and you know his principles, good, bad, and different. And of course, my own kind of Vitruvius 
in life was uh, Thomas Gordon Smith, who was a Vitruvian, uh, oh, who yes. was a Vitruvian guy and spent probably 20 years of his life trying to translate Vitruvius and then translate it kind of like Palladio with Barbaro, tried to translate it into drawings because he himself is not a Latinist, is not a classicist scholar. So he tried to do the drawings and understand Vitruvius for today based on archeology span and so on. And so he showed me Vitruvius uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a wonderful contemporary way. And uh, all the other great people like Perot that, you know, before he did his own treatise, mm -hmm. treatise ordinance, he did his Vitruve. So there's this whole tradition of people studying Vitruvius and then coming up with their own theory. Um, and uh, uh, so, yeah, no question Vitruvius is important to me. Uh, and Palladio, it gives kind of a, I guess he's the teacher. He's the, my teacher who shows me Vitruvius or shows me this or that. Not that I can't learn from all the Bs, you know, the Berninis and Borminis. Okay. Or the Ts, the Terries and the, um, you know. Can't uh, learn, more learn how not to do things sometimes. Uh, <laughs> Um, I've got a question from Timothy Smith. Do you know Timothy? Fantastic teacher here. The only classical teacher in Europe, as far as I know. So there we go. We've got some... Well, I'm not the only one. Jonathan is Jonathan, one. Jonathan, <laughs> yes. But you're Jonathan's <laughs> mouthpiece, yeah. as we've established. Yeah, yeah a little bit. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask about teaching. Uh, yeah, we teach, we teach classical architecture in London and uh, currently in Miami, which is lots of fun, albeit remotely. Um, and uh, I just wanted to, uh, it's quite hard, um, you know, our, our students, um, perhaps more so than Notre Dame ones, there's a, there's a degree of unlearning in teaching, yeah. them, um, yeah. it, teaching them classical architecture and, 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 and getting them to stick to both principles and precedent in their, in their work. Um, I wondered if you had a secret. Well, I don't know about a secret, but my method is um, based on the American uh, version of uh, the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, that is the Ecole de Beaux-Arts principle or method, but translated into, you've got to graduate in five years. And so it's taught like, you know, modern studios that we do in England and the US, but uh, the um, studying precedent, drawing it, maybe the analytique, uh, so you get to details. Drawing the orders, I have my students all draw the orders at um, quote, full scale. That is a one foot diameter, uh, Doric Ionic Corinthian order. And um, we leave out the Tuscan and the composite because they're so easy. And uh, uh, draw the orders, use the esquisse method, uh, try to keep to the esquisse, uh, study precedent, uh, do watercolor. And I think if you do that at, no at Notre Dame for five years or four years, really a studio, you can get a pretty good education. And then you have to, of course, go to England and work for somebody, you know, somebody famous who knows how to do it. Thanks. Yeah, I think the, the full scale thing we found is really uh, helpful. And, and uh, we find that our, our students tend to, I mean, not only classical architecture, but all architecture, they can see it quite diagrammatically. And so drawing the orders in two dimensions at full scale, or we've done big models with them as well, because um, you know, it's the physical presence of the moldings rather necessary than having to learn the names of them all and you know, the geometry, that's an important exercise, but it's the physical presence of them that is, is, is the real thing. Uh, it's that's great. Well. Yeah. I love hearing that. Mm. We, we, need, we need to uh, encourage you all to keep up the great work and um, yeah, we've been at it uh, for um, 30 years, 31 years at Notre Dame. So uh, it's a tradition now, small t. It's a, you know, Robert Adam wouldn't like that, use the word tradition about 30 years, but it's a tradition at Notre Dame for 30 years and uh, the students do it pretty well. And yeah. um, we need to keep doing better though. We need to keep working at it. And we need more architects teaching here is what we really need. We need more practitioners because I do believe in practice and reality. And that's my precedent side, my kind of uh, naughty precedent side. I wanna see people who are actually doing things and how they're doing it and grappling with, with uh, what are they called? What do you call them in England? We call them budgets. What do you call them? Yeah, budget, yeah. yeah. Constraints. <laughs> Constraints. And, and occasionally opportunities. Yeah, kill oh, that's what that's what we call them opportunities. Yeah, yeah. 
Thank you. Okay. Um, have I missed anyone else? I mean, I've, I've got actually, this is a question. I put your um, work on my Instagram uh, feed and someone called David Gibbs, I don't know if you know him. Uh, he said, um, ask Duncan Stroik what a modest church um, like St. James's Piccadilly or St. Andrew's by the wardrobe would cost in the US today. That's a good question, actually. Okay, St. James Piccadilly. Should I look it up? I'm sure um, you know it. Well, I do, but I, I know too many of those nice uh, buildings. Uh, can just you just describe real Fortin's quick? And the Masons? Yeah, go ahead. I just said it's next to Fortin's and Masons where you no doubt yeah. go for tea when you're in London. Yes, you go for tea. Okay. Yeah, what would it cost in the US today? Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, amazing. So we built a, a bunch of these in the early 20th century, in the, sorry, in the colonial era. Uh, they're Anglican churches mainly. Uh, the famous one is uh, Christ Church in Philadelphia where the uh, uh, framers, uh, sorry, the, um, uh, the founders of the, 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 the US met, all those guys that broke away from their evil overlords. I forget what country it was and the Christ Church, and then in Philadelphia, and then uh, St. Paul's in New York, and there's a bunch of them uh, are inspired by this. And they're interesting because is St. James brick on the outside or stone? Stone. It's brick. It is brick. So yeah, very American. I mean, that's a very American church. And uh, this is what we used to do when we were Anglicans. We all used to do this, a perfect building, beautiful, inspiring. Uh, but to do this today, I don't know how big it is, but this is real money. Yeah, this is 25 million dollars i don't know it's real money i don't know maybe right. good for 22 i don't know but it's really good mm, mm, mm. so tens of millions then yeah like our our little uh chapel for 900 in tampa which is so simple it's just a simple cube on the outside that was like 12 million dollars so this is like twice as much I'd say, you know, stained glass. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Printing columns are too expensive. If you go with Doric, you save half, you know, save lots of money. Yes, yes. <laughs> Just kidding. But no, um, yeah, so I think they're pretty expensive. And, but, you know, Americans don't have money today, so I wouldn't try to do this in the U.S. Right. No, you need Gridden and Gibbons to do the... Um, the just around the altar as well. Oh my goodness, look at that. That's phenomenal. Yeah, yeah it is. It's amazing. Yeah. If you're if you're in oh. London, next time you're in London, have a look at that. It's it's incredible. There are things like peas with uh, in their pods and uh, oh. tulips, uh, which are sort of wilting because they're almost dead. It's it's quite phenomenal. That oh, actually. it's so, that, so that amazing. Oh, it's so so verdant. And I do have to say that uh, I think perfect for this building is the stained glass with all the opaque around the, the white. Yeah, yeah. And I love that style. The real uh, Gothic purists, of course, hate that, hate this. But I think it's a wonderful way to bring images into the window and fit uh, beautifully with the building while still allowing a lot of light in. So we've been yeah. experimenting with that too, because I actually like churches with a lot of light. And so do my clients. So we put in dark stained glass and then we have to spend all this money for fancy uh, electrical lights to compensate. And it's kind of, uh, I'd, I'd rather do it the natural way. Mm -hmm. And that's a very good point. Um, well, we have neatly come to um, eight o'clock here. I don't know what time it is your end, but um, I'm slightly behind. Um, well, I'm just, I think as it's, uh, Let's let's end while I've still got more questions, but let's 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 end it there. And maybe we'll we'll just um, do our usual emails to each other about sc who's better, Scamozzi or Palladio, and which oh, capital should be used. I love that debate. I love yeah, that debate. Uh, we'll, we'll keep going with that. What a pleasure! Um, Thank you. So just just a, um, I mean, I thought that was absolutely fascinating, and I suppose what comes across, and it's something you've mentioned, that even people who aren't Catholic, um, like me. Um, appreciate these buildings and see their own God in them. You know, it's, it's, it's an expression of the divine. And in a way, I think beauty is, is incredibly uh, ecumenical. I think everyone, when they see something beautiful, they go, wow, you know, it is something um, very special and, and touches, touches us all. Um, so thank you so much for that. That was really, really fascinating and great to hear everyone's questions. Um, just to let you know, 
Um, our next month's lecture is the great Leon Creer. Uh, where, where do we get all these legends from? You know, this is, this is fantastic. So um, that's something to look forward to and do, do hook up on, on that if you have, um, if you're available. And also um, do join TAG if you're not a member already. Um, we'd love to uh, welcome you into the fold. So um, thank you, um, Duncan, and um, a round of applause. I don't know whether we do that, but um, I, think, I think that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>